So welcome everybody. I'm Howard Friedman. I'm the director of the Jewish Community Library in San Francisco, and I'm very happy to welcome you to today's program with Amanda Miriam Chaya Siegel. I want to thank our co-sponsor, the Workers Circle Arbiter Ring of Northern California, and our co-presenters at the Jewish Folk Chorus of San Francisco and Klez, California. I'd like to thank the Friends of the Jewish Community Library, who are, our, who are our largest source of support for making everything we do possible. I hope you'll consider becoming a friend by giving at any level at friendsofthejcl.org. Please note that automated closed captioning can be turned on or off by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Also, we'll all be muted during the program, but if you have any questions, uh, please put them in the chat and then I will relay them to the presenter at the end. I am very happy to welcome Amanda Miriam Chaya Siegel joining us from Brooklyn. For the Jewish library world of which I'm a part, Miriam Chaya is part of the small staff that makes the New York Public Library's Dorot Jewish Division one of the country's greatest resources for Jewish related materials and research. Outside of her day job, she's a fantastic Yiddish singer and scholar in Yiddish music and culture. She released her album, Toys and Tommen, A Thousand Flavors, in 2015. She received YIVO's Joseph Kremen Memorial Fellowship for her research project, The Broder Singers, Forerunners of the Yiddish Theater. And she's a contributor to the Digital Yiddish Theater Project and co-editor with Alyssa Quint of the Multi-Pronged Women on the Yiddish Stage Project with a book of scholarly articles to be released later this year. And you'll learn about that today. Miriam Chaya, we're so glad to have you here. The floor is now yours. Thank you so much, Howard, and thank you, Rebecca. I'm very happy to be here and to see all of you. Um, and I'll just go ahead and get started. So um, the description of today's event is basically about how women have participated in the Yiddish theater from its first days, but most Yiddish theater scholarship doesn't adequately represent women's achievements or even deal with gender. So. Women on the Yiddish Stage is a series of publications that amplify women's voices through primary sources, such as memoirs and letters by Yiddish actresses, translated and published in English for the first time, and scholarly articles about women as creative leaders in the historical Yiddish theater, and also a volume of plays in Yiddish by women writers translated into English for the first time. So my co-editor on this project is Dr. Elisa Quint, who's a historian and author specializing in Yiddish literature, theater, and Jewish studies. Her book is called The Rise of the Modern Yiddish Theater, and it's about Avram Goldfaden, the official founder of the Yiddish theater and the early days of Yiddish theater in Europe. And as Howard said, my professional background is as a scholar and as a performer, and I've spent many years um, dealing with primary sources like plays, sheet music, recordings, memoirs, uh, literature, and the press. So when we talk about women on the Yiddish stage, we're actually talking about a lot of things. It's actually not just about actresses. And by the way, being an actress is a huge job. So that alone would be enough. But we're talking about women in the Yiddish theater more generally, uh, on stage and off. And we're talking about highlighting um, women's contributions and also looking at historical documents that are not easily accessible. So this project is also about gender and Yiddish culture more broadly. I think it's important to ask why a language and culture so deeply associated with women is all too often represented mostly by men as writers, as leaders, as cultural creators. Partly it's that men have historically had more access to money, more access to leadership in the cultural and religious sphere, they haven't been expected to be responsible for the re reproductive choices, for childcare, or for housework. They haven't been judged as much based on their age or their looks, and they've been more able to move about the world freely. But it's also that women actually, women's voices are there in history, and if you look hard enough, you'll actually find amazing resources and stories about women who have done amazing things. For example, um, talking about the field of Yiddish literature, I've identified more than 860 women who wrote in Yiddish, and I'm sure there are many more. And I think whatever our gender identity, which I realize can be very flexible and different for each person, um, we're all enriched by greater representation of underrepresented voices in a variety of contexts. So how did this project get started? Actually, it wasn't my idea. 
Um, oops, sorry, just having an issue advancing the slide, one sec. So it's actually Elisa's <laughs> idea. So Elisa, Dr. Elisa Quint is my co-editor and she's the one who initiated this project. She got an invitation in 2016 to organize a conference at Columbia University about Yiddish theater. So she had just finished writing her book on Avram Goldfaden, illustrated here, and she wasn't even planning to keep writing about theater, but she decided to do the conference only if it could be about women. This was because during her research, she was so struck by how the Yiddish literary scene was so male dominated, or as she puts it, utterly saturated by men. But she was having, she was having, you know, a hard time coming up with people that could actually speak on this topic. So um, that's how she contacted me. She wanted to find scholars that could talk about women in the Yiddish theater. So I drew on some um, archival sources and publications to try to fill the gaps. And again, it's not that women haven't historically been active. It's just that scholars haven't really looked at women's contributions through the lens of gender or thought about how misogyny affects women's representation and participation in the Yiddish theater. They haven't asked questions like, why when we think of great actors, is it always men? Why do women have to be in a separate category of actresses? Is there a hierarchy here? What about people who transgress gender roles? Where is our place? And I'm especially interested in biography and memoir about women and other underrepresented groups. In the Yiddish context, this includes looking at how Yiddish actresses wrote about themselves in their memoirs, how they present themselves to the audience of readers, since these memoirs are often serialized in the Yiddish press, and also how male critics and writers perceive Yiddish actresses. So, this project, which started as one volume, actually became a, a project, as, as Howard put it, a multi-pronged project. So it's uh, composed of a volume of scholarly articles on women in the Yiddish theater, which is Mir Tzashem, going to be published uh, this year. Also a series of Yiddish to English translations from primary sources, like memoirs, letters, and articles by and about Yiddish actresses. And those are being published in an ongoing fashion on the website of the Digital Yiddish Theater Project, which I'll share with you later. Um, we already have several that are published and more in the works. And finally, a volume of Yiddish to English translations of plays by women. That is uh, three, three plays in Yiddish by women that are appearing in English for the first time. And um, actually, I believe two out of the three, or maybe one out of the three were never published ever in English, in Yiddish, or in any language. So that's uh, those are the aspects of the project. So before, um, before actually, I'll just go back for a sec. So I think if you're here, you probably understand why this is an important project. But um, I just want to say that, uh, you know, gender, like I said before, is really... It's not binary for everybody. It may be fluid and there's different ways to identify. And as a member of the queer community, I'm especially aware that it can be very complicated. So I just wanna say we're focusing here on um, gender in a historical sense, while also realizing that history is really evolving as we speak in terms of gender. And I'll do my best to be sensitive to that as a cisgender person. And also there's a rich history of gender transgression and drag <laughs> in the Yiddish theater. So that's something that we also can draw on as part of this rich history. So speaking of drag, this next slide um, is of a couple of early performers. So basically, um, I want to give you a little Yiddish theater history for those that don't know the field to talk about the history of the Yiddish theater, but also specifically about gender within that context. So the first, basically there was no secular Jewish, well, there's no secular Yiddish performance you know, until about 1854. So before then, basically, um, you know, there were barchonim that would entertain at a wedding. There were musicians that would play for dancing, sometimes for Simchas Toida, and for Purim, there were the Purim plays, but there was no secular tradition of people acting or performing just for fun, not for a religious holiday. So around 1854, this all-male group called the Broderzinger, or the Broder Singers got started 
And it was basically a group of guys that wanted to um, do entertainment for fun. So they would do folk songs and they would make up skits to go with them. And it was very primitive in terms of performance. You know, they didn't have they didn't have a lot of costumes. They didn't have much of a set. They didn't have a theater to perform and they just kind of performed wherever they sat in the audience. And they just walked on the stage. So it was very primitive. But um, one aspect of that actually was playing in drag. And even though this photo, um, which is from 1884, actually um, you show some actors from the Brodersinger that continued to perform in Yiddish theater for many years, even after the Yiddish theater officially started in 1876. So actually, um, Joyner Reisman, who's on the left, was a very prominent actor who had a very long career. This is actually from a retrospective of 50 years of his career in the theater. And Hermann Weinberg, who is on the right, played the role of Breine, a female role. So Weinberg had a high voice and specialized in playing female roles. So before, um, before when it was an all-male group, they did have female roles, but cisgender men, for lack of a better term, were the ones that played those roles. Often it was young men who were too um, young to have a beard yet, and um, they would also play uh, women of all, all ages. So um, there were even skits where it was two female characters, both played by, by young men without beards. So... Um, this is a very interesting aspect that predated the official Yiddish theater. So in 1876, Avram Goldfaden officially founded the Yiddish theater in Yas, Romania. And um, Goldfaden was a very interesting person who failed at a lot of things, at a lot of businesses, but he was successful in officially establishing the Yiddish theater. And uh, that is the date that's generally accepted by scholars, 1876. So um, basically he was considered the founder, he is considered the founder of the Yiddish theater. So after this tradition of sort of primitive actors, which lasted for about 20 years and continued, he tried to make like a professional modern Yiddish theater starting in 1876. And just to talk a little bit about the idea of Yiddish theater. so. You know, as I said before, before the Brodersinger, there wasn't a secular Yiddish performance tradition, and there wasn't really much of secular um, Yiddish culture at all. So it was kind of part of a larger movement where Yiddish speaking Jews started to think about being more modern. They started to think about creating their own um, newspapers, literature, um, political and social and cultural organizations kind of developing a modern culture. So it was part of a larger movement. And um, also we have to remember that, you know, Jewish culture is not a monolith. I think there's this myth that everybody was like super religious and that was the only option, but actually there were a lot of, it's much more nuanced than that in terms of theater as well, because for some people theater could be actually a vehicle of encouraging Jewish culture and rather than a vehicle of assimilation or vice versa. So it's actually very nuanced. But in terms of the background of Yiddish theater, it started just like the Brodersinger as being all male because they had to take their actors from the ranks of people that actually had experience and these were men. But audiences soon said, no, we actually want women to perform too, even though there was a, a traditional religious prohibition against hearing women's voices in public, that was soon overturned, um, at least in the theater scene, um, so that women could perform women's roles on the stage and actually having a nice singing voice, especially for women was really required to be an actress. And the emphasis generally in the Yiddish theater was on raw talent. And this is not just the case for the beginning, but I think throughout time, it's not like people went to a conservatory. Well, a few did, but, um, you know, men often had training as a, a cantor, as a chazan or, or a, choir, a choir boy or cantorial assistant, a mishoirer, but women didn't generally didn't have that, that training. But despite that, there was a pretty low bar to entry um, in terms of actually getting into the Yiddish theater. It was more like a raw talent. So 
the first, generally the first woman in the Yiddish theater is accepted by scholars to be Sophia Karp. Um, there are actually a few other names that I read in Zalman Zilbertzweig's Lexicon for Yiddish and Theater, which is a giant um, seven volume encyclopedia of the biographies of Yiddish actors. But generally, Sophia Karp is considered to be the first Yiddish actress. Supposedly, in 1877, so just a year after the Yiddish theater was officially founded, Goldfaden heard a beautiful voice singing in Galati, Romania, and it turned out to belong to this teenage seamstress named Sora Segal, who later changed her name because it sounded more modern to Sophia. So um, we'll talk about her last name as well. So basically, she was a teenager, and um, she was really excited to join the theater, but her mother wouldn't let her and said, as long as you're in my house, you're not going to do this. So she had no choice but to marry one of the members of the troupe. There was actually only one. So there were two actors, and Goldfaden was the director, and one of the actors and Goldfaden were already married. So she basically had to marry the only single guy, um, Sachar Goldstein, and so she became... Sophie Goldstein. Um, later, he unfortunate or unfortunately died, and she married Carp, hence the name Sophia Carp. But she was actually a very interesting person because I'm um, just going to tell you a little bit about more about her background. So she actually had a really long career as an actor and as a director. She um, also, as in many cases, her daughter uh, Rosa Carp or Rochel named after one of her theatrical roles. Her daughter was also an actor. And um, Sophia Karp was also one of the first actors to come to the United States to work in the Yiddish theater here. So she worked throughout Romania, she worked throughout Europe. But then in 1883, when Yiddish theater was banned in the Russian Empire, she had to uh, find <laughs> some other options and eventually came to the United States. And what's interesting, too, is that she was one of the founders of the Grand Theater, which was the first purpose-built Yiddish theater on the Lower East Side in New York City. So um, unfortunately, the theater didn't actually uh, last very long. It was, it was built in 1903, and she was the only woman in a group of like four or five men, very all very prominent people that were partners. And of course, there was a lot of drama behind the scenes about the leadership of the theater. And supposedly she stayed in her dressing room and refused to leave and became seriously chilled and tragically died of pneumonia at age 39. And hopefully my calculations are right with the dates here. I see now that that might not be exactly right. It looks more like 40, 43 ish, but she, um, so she was a very interesting person. And actually, her funeral was one of the first like mass funerals on the Lower East Side, and especially her female fans were just completely bereaved. And it was just very, um, there was almost a riot there. So she's a very important um, pioneering actress of the Yiddish theater, but it also shows that she really didn't have a choice other than to get married <laughs> to start her career, basically. So um, that's that's very interesting. But in time, these um, heterosexual family dynasties, um, I would love to hear about a queer family dynasty. Maybe they're developing as we speak. But, um, you know, there were like these these heterosexual family dynasties that developed over time. So people would have kids, their kids would become actors and managers and work in the box office. So it became kind of a family thing. So another one of my favorite actresses is Regina Prager, who also had a really interesting background. So she was um, she was born in Lviv, which uh, or Lemberg, as it was called then, which is in the Ukraine. It was then in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And she actually had a tragic childhood. There was um, ter this terrible fire that broke out over Shabbos. And um, she was um, she was sharing a bed with her mother, maybe even on the stove, as people used to sleep on or near the stove to keep warm because they didn't really have central heating. And her mother perished in the fire, but she escaped. So ever since then, she was like very marked by this tragedy. And she was very, um, a very unique personality in that she um, 
was very shy and very religious, very modest, and she didn't like to engage in any backstage gossip or socializing. She kind of just wanted to do her thing and get out. And so she joined the um, the chorus of the Scarbeck Theater in Lviv and became a, a chorus singer. And actually, that was a really good decision because there she met um, Janka Ver Gimpel, who had been in the chorus for 40 years and finally got a permit to um, open his own Yiddish theater. And this was the beginning of Gimple's theater, which um, ended up lasting for decades. And um, this was really the first, one of the first Yiddish theaters in all of the world and um, one of the most uh, long enduring theaters. And because of her being there at that time, she was actually one of the first prima donnas of the theater. There's a very interesting um, series of articles translated by Beth Dwoskin that you can read on the um, Digital Yiddish Theater Project in which um, Mendel Oshorovitz uh, interviews her. And even though his view is kind of condescending, um, it's an interesting interview. Also, another thing is that she sort of, um, she sort of lost the opportunity to perform after a while because she came to America and she was always a really big star. She was actually more of a singer than an actor. And she even wanted to become an opera singer, but Goldfaden told her, oh, well, if you're in the opera, like you're gonna have to cross yourself. And she was like, oh, I can't handle that. So she stayed in the Yiddish theater. But what's interesting is that she kind of lost opportunities after a certain point because of her age. Does that sound familiar? So as a middle-aged to older woman, she really wasn't finding roles that were right for her that really utilized her talents until the play The Chazente came along uh, with music by Rumshinsky, where she played, um, in this case, uh, Chazente is interpreted as the wife or actually a widow in this play of a cantor, a very like powerful and beautiful and spiritual role where she could really use her singing. So that was kind of her big comeback. And supposedly that paved the way for more roles like that of these kind of singing mother types. Um, so that's a very interesting aspect of her career. So while she was working um, in the Polish theater, she also met Berta Kalich, who was a couple years younger than her. Kalich supposedly started in, in the chorus when she was about 13. <laughs> she was very tall. so. Um, Kalich was just really a pioneering actress in many regards. She had an unusual background because she was from a very traditional religious home, but her parents actually supported her in her theatrical ambitions, maybe because she was the only child and she was born 10 years after her parents' marriage. They just kind of let her do what she wanted to do, and they even um, followed her around as she toured. Um, so she became this, this chorus singer, and then that's where she met Regina Prager and Janka Ver Gimpel. And so she also became an early prima donna in um, Gimpel's theater. She worked a lot with Goldfaden. She also spent a lot of time in Bucharest at the Jignitsa Theater, which was a major home for Yiddish theater at that time. And she has some very interesting uh, parts of her memoir where she talks about working there and um, talks about the anti-Semitism that she faced. She talks about singing with a bunch of actors for um, Kol Nidre services. And eventually she came, she apparently because there was like people were trying to poison her, they didn't want her to be successful. She fled to America in the middle of the night when she got an offer from Joseph Edelstein to work for his theater there. So she came to the US and by this time she was getting kind of sick of doing this kind of, you know, melodramatic stuff with um, just music, but not really serious acting that kind of the early Yiddish theater sort of lacked for repertoire. There's basically Goldfaden. And then there was a lot of translations from world literature. And then there were playwrights who churned out this sort of like really cheesy, you know, melodramas that were kind of over the top playwrights like um, Latiner and Horvitz. So that's kind of what she was stuck playing. And she really wanted to become a serious dramatic actress. So ultimately she got her chance um, with the repertoire of Jacob Gordon, who they call the Jewish Shakespeare, he was very interested in writing contemporary plays. He actually wrote a couple of roles for her where she got to play a modern woman dealing with modern issues. So that actually um, 
ultimately enabled her to make it onto the English language stage and Broadway. And she was the first Yiddish actress to do so, to become a crossover star. Um, but as a woman, her behavior was really heavily scrutinized. She always had to have a chaperone with her. And even though her marriage was very unhappy, she sort of just had to stay with her husband because she didn't have, she didn't really have a choice. So you can also read some of her memoirs on the Digital Yiddish Theater Project site. And she's a very interesting person. And here she is as Hamlet. She was actually only the second woman after Sarah Bernhardt, also a Jewish actress, to perform Hamlet. And she was the first to do so in Yiddish. So I talked also um, about this uh, kind of lack of serious repertoire. So in the early Yiddish theater, there wasn't that much repertoire. And an exception to this, a very interesting exception is what we believe to be the first Yiddish play by a woman um, to be published. And this is Die Agune, a drama in vier Akten by Maria Lerner, who was a very interesting person. So she was actually um, born in the Russian Empire and she was a writer, she was a fiction writer. And she wrote several plays. This is apparently the only one that was published, but she actually wrote um, several different plays. And it's very interesting she actually um, converted to Christianity. Her husband converted and then she converted and then <laughs> so did their children. And they were all like, her children were all very prominent um, artists and, and intellectuals. But um, it's a very interesting play. I don't want to give away um, the details, but it's about a young woman from a well-to-do family who marries this businessman that her father chooses rather than the man that she loves. And the businessman turns out to be a crook and he deserts her. And then she's just kind of stuck because under Jewish law, she can't do anything until she has a get. So she has to send a detective to find him and get the get. And eventually she ends up getting it and she is able to marry the man she loves and have a couple of kids and have a really good life. But then um, the bad guy comes back and threatens to just destroy her life again. and. Well, the play, the play is no doubt melodramatic, as were that was the style of this time, but it's also very interesting because it shows the kind of things that women had to deal with at that time. And um, I'm happy to say that the play is being published as part of our series of um, three translated plays. It's been translated by Clo Piazza, and we're really looking forward to that. So another one of my favorites um, is Pepe Litvan. We were talking before about um, drag and about the early days of the Broder Singer where um, men would dress in drag to play female roles. Well, probably you might know about Molly Pecan if you know about Yiddish theater at all, but um, Pepe Litvan has become sort of this transcestor reclaimed by the queer community as seen as, as an early drag king on the Yiddish stage. So basically she was really the only um, actress of her time where like her whole thing was doing these roles. It wasn't like an occasional thing, but this was really her main thing. And she here you see her dressed as a modern dandy. Um, I believe this photo comes from the Forberts archive. Shout out to Hanna Polak, who was the one that I first uh, told me about Pepe. And she just had these amazing outfits, as you can see, and she also would sometimes dress as a chassid. She was a very interesting performer because, um, like many people, she came from a very modest background, but she was quite an astute businesswoman, and she um, led her own troupe. She spoke several languages, and she rose from a very modest background to become extremely um, successful and popular, and she was known for being really spirited and charming and even vulgar even vulgar to the point where they once they had to send her on a vacation because they were afraid her show would be banned. But it's very interesting the way that she was able to do these roles, maybe because of wearing this, this male clothing, that she was able to do these roles that were more, um, more vulgar and more, more risque. Um, it's also, just on a sad note, she actually, um, she had been saving, she'd been saving her money 
for a long time, actually, she spent some years in the Soviet Union after the, like, during and after the First World War, and she'd been saving money to marry off her daughter. But when the stock market crashed, um, she actually lost all her money, and she was she was basically um, died in a charity hospital and a group of actors had to organize money to um, pay for her funeral expenses. But she um, made a number of commercial recordings, especially in the US, and you can hear a lot of them online. And she's just become a source of inspiration for some films and theater projects. And it's really delightful to see um, how people are reinterpreting her material. So another really interesting, I mean, I could just go on and on about these biographies, um, but I'll try to rein myself in with just a couple more. Um, that's really my focus. Like I said, there's um, a volume of scholarly articles that deals with various actresses and aspects of gender and various productions. Um, there's also these translations from primary sources. And because I mainly focus on editing the translations, I'm really interested in these details of people's lives. So another really interesting person is Kyla Grober, who was actually, um, you can read some of her memoirs in translation on the Digital Yiddish Theater Project website. They were translated by Violet Lutz. She was a very interesting person because um, she was an original member of the Habima, the first Hebrew, um, the Hebrew theater troupe that was founded in, in Russia, or I believe, the Soviet Union at that time, um, and she was she was a founding member of this amazing um, theater troupe, which eventually split up, and they kind of went in their different directions. And there's still a Habima in Israel, but after the split of the theater, she and she wrote two memoirs. You can read a lot more about that. But after the split, she actually um, went off on her own, and she started basically developing one woman shows as a spoken word artist, as a singer. And she would actually do field work to learn new material. She traveled all over the world, um, both before and after the Second World War. She was actually um, one of the first performers to um, tour uh, areas of Europe to meet with um, Holocaust survivors. And she even met some, some young people who knew her repertoire from their parents. So that was really moving for her. But she also spent time in Israel and um, she ended up settling in Canada and opening a Yiddish theater studio there. She also worked in um, on Canadian television in English. So she was a very, very accomplished person and she really developed her own material. And again, this is something that you don't really hear about. So she's a very interesting person. You can also hear, um, you can hear at least one of her concerts on the, um, the Yiddish Book Center has some recordings from the Montreal Jewish Public Library where you can listen to some of her recordings. So Jenny Goldstein is another person that I'm completely obsessed with. So um, she's just a very interesting person to me because she lived through many, many eras of Yiddish theater and yet somehow was able to continue working for about 60 years which was almost her entire lifetime. So the story goes that um, she started uh, in the Yiddish theater at the age of six. Her neighbor was a member of the chorus in the Yiddish theater and heard little Jenny, you know, singing her baby brother to sleep next door and said, oh, we actually need a child actor for this show. So her first role was to sing this really like sad little song of a child from a dysfunctional family. And she actually um, was very successful and she ended up um, playing child roles for a number of years. And she was from an immigrant family. She's actually one of the only prominent Yiddish actresses that we hear about that was actually born in the U.S. and not elsewhere. Um, she was born in the U.S. on the Lower East Side to immigrant parents. So she basically played children's roles and she played with a lot of the big um, classic you know, actors of her time, like Berta Kalle, Regina Prager, Kenny Lipton, and um, absorbed that style. So she went through these different eras of Yiddish theater. She went through the sort of the literary era with Jacob Gordon, with these more serious literary dramas. Then um, she became really this queen of melodrama. When she got to a certain age in the Yiddish theater, 
she started to do um, grown up roles, but I don't know if it was rivalry or what happened, but she couldn't really find a place there. So she ended up doing vaudeville for a while and became very popular. Then <laughs> she meets a man about 20 years older than her named Max Gable, who's already um, a seasoned actor and very prolific playwright. So they get married. He starts writing plays for her and she becomes this huge melodrama queen. So it's very interesting here on the right is a, kind of a montage of some of her roles, which I just love. Again, you see her in drag, which I think is so great. Um, but you see like kind of the range, even though these pictures, you know, are pretty like campy and over the top, you can really see the range of the roles that she did. Um, I've heard that the best actors are those that can do comic and tragic roles. And she really excelled at that. So she became this tragic actress um, doing these melodramas. It's very interesting in terms of how they look at gender because often they were about like a young, young woman who like really is very honest and a very good person, but because of her circumstances, because of poverty and being tricked or exploited by, usually by men, um, she, she kind of ends up in a bad situation and the audience really um, sympathizes with her and she played some very, very interesting roles and became this huge star. And it was very cathartic. Like people would come to these plays and just Jenny Goldstein would cry and the audience would cry. She also, um, there aren't that many women that have uh, written lyrics for Yiddish theater during this time. There are a number of exceptions. Um, Jenny Goldstein actually wrote quite a number of lyrics for her characters. Molly Pecan did as well. She's probably the most prolific. Nellie Kassman was also a lyricist and a composer, but you don't really hear about women as lyricists. We actually have a great article in the book um, by Ron Raboy that is about Molly Pecan as a lyricist, which is a very fascinating look at her lyrics. Um, but Jenny Goldstein was another person that also wrote lyrics. And she actually... Um, turned away from melodrama, um, actually around the time of World War II. She spent a couple of years in um, Argentina, mostly, and Brazil. And when she came back to New York, she said, because of all the tragedy that we've been through, I need to focus on comedy. So she kind of reinvented herself as a comedian and made some very, very hilarious albums. <laughs> Um, where she sings these songs with a lot of like code switching, mixing Yiddish and English and very, very funny material. And she also worked on Broadway. She was in a Tennessee Williams play and she was also, um, she worked on television. She actually, um, tragically, she, she became ill when she was working on a project for CBS and she died um, in 1960. So she's a very interesting person. And she also had her own theater. She was one of the few um, women to have her own theater that she actually managed. Some women had theaters that were just named after them, but it was kind of more of a draw to get people in. But she actually had her own theater where she was you know, running the theater. She was um, hiring the people and developing the repertoire. And it didn't always last that long. She had the Prospect Theater um, in the Bronx. And she also had a theater on Second Avenue in Manhattan. Um, she also was in a film called Two Sisters, which I really recommend. It's um, it's almost so bad that it's good. It's um, from the National Center for Jewish Film. You can get it. And it's a story of two sisters who um, basically Jenny is the older sister who has to take on the mother role after her mother dies. So she's responsible for her younger sister who um, repays her by stealing her fiance it's really, it's a melodrama, but it's a fascinating document of the acting styles of the time and of Jenny Goldstein. And she just comes across as this incredibly just sympathetic person. It's just really, really worth um, seeing the film. So, whoops. So yeah, so those are some of the biographies which I could just totally get carried away with. But in terms of what's actually in the volume, which is hopefully going to be published very soon. We have um, the table of contents. So there's a wonderful um, piece on memoirs of three actresses um, by Nina Varnke, where she looks at how these three actresses present themselves in their memoirs, and she kind of contrasts them. 
We also have a great article by Sonia Golantz about the choreographer and dancer Judith Berg and her work. There's also an article by Vivi Lax, who I believe is here, about women in London's Yiddish music halls at the turn of the 20th century. Um, Vivi also has a couple of great books, um, London Yiddish Town, which was just published last year, and also um, another book about, um, oh, I'm sorry, I have it on my shelf, but I can't remember the title right now, but um, White Chapel Noise, that's it. Also, as I mentioned, we have Molly Pecan as lyricist by Ron Raboy, a wonderful piece on Miriam Cresson by Carrot O'Brien, based on archival research with um, a lot of uh, scripts, radio scripts. A really interesting article about women in Lithuanian Yiddish theater um, that's focusing on the actresses and directors um, Rochelle Berger and Sofia Erdi. We also have a really interesting piece by Deborah Kaplan about Sonia Alomas, who was a member of the famed Vilna Truppe. It's kind of about how do we reconstruct the biography of an actress when we can't find any documents in her own voice. Then we have a piece by Tova Markinson that talks about Argentinian Yiddish theater and how the um, how sex worth sex work I'm sorry connects with the theater there in the underworld in Buenos Aires. Then there's another article by um, Veronica Belling about Sarah Sylvia, who was a Yiddish actress based in South Africa, who had a really international career. Very interesting biography. And we have a great treatment of Ida Kaminska's interpretation of Mutter Courage, which is really fascinating. Um, there's also a great piece about Diana Blumenfeld, who is pictured here. She was an actor and singer. She, she and her husband, Jonas Turkov, were the only two actors, I believe, that survived the Warsaw Ghetto. And she became a really important voice for survivors after the war as a radio personality and as a performer. And finally, we have an amazing um, piece about a Yiddish theater family of Dina Koenig and Leah Koenig Stolper, whose careers spanned um, Romania and Israel and all the different developments during that time. So that's coming up. And then, like I said, we have these three plays. Um, and we have uh, Yaguna, we discussed. There's also the play Ana Finjena by Paula Prolitsky, translated by Alan Lewis Rickman. And Sonia Itelson, Oder a Kind, a kind by Lena Brown, translated by Miro Minyevsky. And this is a very interesting play actually about women, about work, about reproductive choices. The play was never published. And um, here's a picture of Lena Brown. And her family actually um, came to Miro and said, can you please translate this? We want to know what it is. And that's how we discovered this amazing play. Then we have um, a number of... Uh, translations that you can read on the Digital Yiddish Theater Project site, um, including some memoir excerpts from Gina Braginskaya, who was an early Yiddish theater actress, Bella Bellarina, uh, and Sepoira Abelman, who wrote a very interesting article complaining about how the Yiddish actors, um, the Hebrew Actors Union was not allowing in new people. And finally, we also have another volume of the memoirs of Esther Rochel Kaminska, translated by Michal Yashinsky, that is coming as well as an individual volume. So that's quite a lot. Um, there's so much more, um, but I think I will stop for now and say thank you and take questions. And I have some um, links to the Digital Yiddish Theater Project and where you can read some of these translations and also to my website where you can learn more about my work. Thank you so much. And I'm excited to hear your questions. Thank you so much. Okay, so we're going to begin uh, with a question from uh, Judy Musante, um, who asks um, how Maria Lerner, the author of the Aguna, uh, got the name Maria. Well, that's actually, um, it sounds weird for a Jewish name, but it's actually not that unusual. Her given name was Miriam Rabinovich, but Maria or Mariasa or Mariana, those are very common like Russian names, even for Jewish people. So it's actually, I believe in some of the publications, it's Maria with, with an E eh sound, um, but that was the name that she, she published under, but her given name was Miriam Rabinovich. Oh, I think you're muted. Yeah, Aaron. sorry about that. Um, so, uh, Eve Sickler, um, I'm going to uh, unmute you, or you can unmute yourself 
now um, and ask a question. Hi, thank you. Uh, am I am I heard? You are <laughs> okay. heard. Thank you. Um, this was fantastic. Thank you so much. I I've been um, wondering about two different um, women actresses. Uh, one from the Soviet Union, whose whose dynasty I think was from at least the 19 teens or the 1910s, named Hanna or Anna Guzik. Uh, I don't know if that's somebody you're familiar with. Some of her recordings are out there, like beautiful Yiddish, uh, you know, 78s. Um, and the other one is uh, a woman performer with the Gosset, uh, the Soviet Yiddish theater um, named Lyolia Rome. Um, so I just wondered if that's, if those are names you've come across. I've heard the name Anna or Hanna Guzik before. I haven't heard of the second one. Part of the issue is that, um, you know, people sort of, <laughs> researchers default to Zalman Zilbertzweig's um, lexicon for Yiddish and Theater sort of as the main source. So if they're not in there, it becomes more difficult to find information. They haven't actually checked in there, but that's a little bit of a difficult area to research, actually, honestly, because um, we might not have access to as many documents um, from that era or from that place, but I would be really curious to know how you heard about them and, you know, what kind of source material is out there, like where the recordings were made and where you found the information. I mean, I, I don't want to take up too much time if other people have questions, but um, for one thing, I think a lot of the source materials are uh, in Russian or Guzik landed up at, you know, towards the end of her life in Israel. So there, you know, there may also be stuff in Hebrew, but there's quite a lot online. I mean, actually, Yelena Shmolensen has been helpful. And also um, Zuskina, um, uh, Zuskin's um, daughter, uh, told Olga Gershenson more about Lyolia Rome. And then Yelena also found more uh, about her. So, yeah. Anyway, Guzik, yeah, her recordings are included in a couple of things that um, Joel Rubin and his then partner uh, Rita issued. So Shalom Comrade, but um, those are only two um, really excellent recordings. That's really how I first got in interested in Guzik. But anyway, there are beautiful posters that show that she actually was performing Yiddish at a time when you would, thought it, you would have thought it was impossible, like the early 1950s. And apparently she had to really fight uh, to do these international concerts and to allow, you know, Yiddish repertoire in any of those performances in those difficult years. And people absolutely revered her, you know, among a couple of other performers that would tour and do Yiddish stuff. But anyway, she had a stage career and uh, including an operetta. And so I think her mother also, or her sister or something like that. Okay, anyway, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. That's super interesting. I would love to learn more later. So I have some questions from the chat. Um, Diana and Joel ask whether Nina Morke uh, talks about Celia Adler or other Adlers, noting that Celia has a memoir. She doesn't. She just con she just contrasts these three, which are from the same generation. Um, Celia Adler, I believe, is from a slightly younger generation, but I'm actually reading her memoirs right now, and they're really interesting. And I would love to. Um, I would love to have more about her as well. Great. So Miriam Isaacs uh, asks whether people had uh, had to pay to be in the Silver Spy via, via union membership. I don't believe so because it was international in scope and it was really a research-based project. But that's a good question. The union was notoriously difficult to get into even well speaking of Celia Adler I believe Celia Adler and some other major stars actually dismally failed their their harrowing auditions and then later became a member but you also had to pay quite a lot of money during that time but no that was not a requirement as far as I know for being included in the lexicon okay thank you so much so Susan Diamond has her hand uh, up Susan can you unmute yourself Susan? Yeah, hi. I'm, I'm in the car and I just pulled over. My question, I don't, I came on late, so I don't know if you've already addressed this. I wanted you to talk about Boris and Bessie Tomaszewski and their role in Yiddish theater. And I don't know if you know this, but our 
wonderful con retired conductor of the San Francisco Symphony, Michael Tilson Thomas, who's their grandson. And I'd just be interested in hearing any comments you could share about those two. Sure. Well, actually, um, Nina Vonke's article deals with Bessie's memoirs, which are really interesting. I've actually read them as well. And yeah, I mean, they played really foundational roles in the Yiddish theater in the United States. And she had a really rough time because um, he was not um, he was not a faithful um, spouse. And eventually they split up and um, she went off on her own and had her own theater. But yeah, they were definitely very foundational um, figures in the early American Yiddish theater. And she also had some really interesting roles, sort of proto-feminist roles, where she played a woman who wanted to vote or um, had a more like political bent, even though it was supposed to be funny. It was also responding to issues of the day. So yeah, very interesting person. Okay. And also, as long as I'm on, have you all talked about Ida Kaminska at all? Because if not, I'd like to hear any comments you might have to say about her and um, also Fiva Schwinkel, um, any of these people that, unless you've already talked about them, because as I said, I came in 15 minutes late and also the Barry sisters. Yeah, so um, the focus of this research project is women on the Yiddish stage and it's about specific um, individuals, although it keeps expanding. So that might be a little beyond the scope, but um, Ida Kaminska is definitely, um, definitely a very prominent actor and we don't have anything uh we do have something actually so there is yeah actually we do have um an article about her interpretation of mother Co courage um in the post-war poland um state yiddish theater so that's definitely worth um reading that's an article by julia rondone that should be published in our scholarly volume that's coming up okay thank you for that Okay, I'll stop so other people have questions, I'm sure. Thank you. Thanks. So actually, I don't see additional questions. So if anybody does have one uh, right now in the chat uh, or, uh, or hold your peace, and uh, this is your opportunity, I maybe we'll just ask one question, which is about um, uh, cross-pollination with, um, uh, with vaudeville, whether any of these uh, performers also were found on the vaudeville stage in New York. Some of them were, although it's very, um, I mean, Jenny Goldstein, for example, had a career in vaudeville when she was a teenager and sort of trying to find her place. But um, she only did that for a few years. It's actually a very difficult area to research because there's not that much scholarly material about it, especially in Yiddish. So I, you know, people come to me all the time with questions about vaudeville and sometimes it's just hard to find documentation behind, besides like the occasional newspaper ad or maybe an article. But in terms of um, scholarly sources, it's a really underrepresented area. So that's, that's a little difficult, but people definitely, you know, they were flexible. A lot of, a lot of actors did work in vaudeville because it's work that was available and, you know, they needed the work. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, Faith Jones, are you able to unmute yourself? Uh, Faith? I'm so sorry, I, I think I had my mute on. Is it un unmuted now? We, we can hear you now. Okay, yeah, so thank you so much, Miriam Chaya, for uh, for this talk. It was really wonderful to hear about so many figures who are really lesser known and um, haven't really been studied that much. I'm wondering if there was one particular figure that you came across in your research who you thought, you know, was just really outstanding and who was maybe a bit surprising. I know, you know, those of us who work in women's history, we're always saying, like, those women were there, they existed, and and we just don't know about them. But there was, was there someone where even you were surprised to find out what they had done or what they had achieved in their life? Well, that's a very interesting question. Thank you. I, I mean, for me, it's probably Jenny Goldstein, I think because I just came across a recording of her um, on cassette tape. They were actually having a sale at Klez Camp years ago and they're having, they were selling out all their cassettes. So I bought everything and I found a cassette of Jenny Goldstein. At first I thought, oh, this sounds really melodramatic and really over the top. 
But then I realized she's actually had an incredible career. And I think people, because of, um, because a lot of her career was in melodrama, people didn't take her seriously, especially as a woman, you know, and they didn't see that as being real acting or like real drama, but she had an incredible emotional range and she also was extremely generous. She helped a lot of actors. Um, she was very, I mean, she, for example, she basically hired an actress um, that she didn't even know to help her get a visa to come to the U.S. after the Second World War. And she supposedly hawked her diamond tiara um, to help pay for a theater. And um, she was from a very humble background, like most Swedish actors, but she was incredibly generous. And she was a business person. She was a creative person, but she was also a business person. She had a wide um, comedic and tragic range. And I sort of dismissed her. I thought, oh, this is just sort of like over the top material. You know, this isn't like real theater or real acting. But actually, she she was actually one of the only Yiddish actors that could be successful in other other languages um, because she just was such a good communicator and, you know, just an incredible talent. Great, thank you. Um, Eve Sikular asks, what were the CBS and Broadway works featuring Jenny Goldstein? So um, she was in a Tennessee Williams play called Camino Royale. And the other play, I actually can't remember the name of it right now, but I could find it for you. And the CBS, I believe it was called CBS Workshop. And it was a show that was filmed in New York. I haven't yet been successful in finding other coverage of her, like in TV or film. I would love to know if you have any suggestions, but um, I'm sure there's a lot more to be found. I feel like I just scratched the surface in terms of um, the research. So there's probably a lot more. Great, thank you. Um, Susan Dime, I think there was a second part to her question that I'm not sure you responded to, which was about Bessie Tomaszewski. Um, if you had anything to say about her? Yeah, so um, like I said, there is a scholarly article by Nina Varnke that looks at Bessie Tomaszewski's memoirs and contrasts them with memoirs of Sarah Adler and um, Berta Kalich. And yeah, I mean, she was a, she was a very early talent. She got started on the Yiddish stage when she was a teenager, and it's very interesting um, in terms of her life and balancing, you know, having a family <laughs> with being on stage and all the difficulties she had with her husband and what it was like trying to make it on her own as an actor, as a theater manager. Um, and her memoirs are certainly worth reading if you read Yiddish. Um, she's really an incredible um, personality. And if you don't, you could read um, Nina Barnke's article, which really is, is worth reading and hopefully should be out in a few months. Great, thanks so much. Um, Yom Yahu Arontob uh, asks, well, he says, it was interesting to see Madame used in the Yiddish playbills and posters. Was that typical? Yes, very typical, um, especially during that time. I think it was sort of meant to connote like a mature woman or a married woman, sort of like it is today. And that was supposed to be a title of respect. So you see Madame Bertha Kalich, Madame Regina Prager, Madame Kenny Lipson. That was very, um, very uh, widespread. But Jenny Goldstein, for example, she always went by her original name, even when she, she was married twice and she never took her husband's name. She always used her, her given name. So yeah, that's, that's very interesting as well. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for being here. And most of all, thank you, Miriam Kaya, for a wonderful presentation and for all the research that you're doing that's just so important and, and so wonderful. Um, thank you very much. Um, so we will send out a, an email message to everybody tomorrow um, with a, a list of resources we have for those of you who are local to uh, things at books and DVDs at the Jewish Community Library that can help you um, further your interest in this topic. And then also some uh, online links, um, including the um, link to the, uh, 
the, um, the uh, Digital Yiddish Theater Project, where a number of, of uh, the articles that, that uh, Mary Pia cited are um, for your reading pleasure. So um, anything you would like to leave us with, Mary Pia, before we go? No, just thank you very much, um, Howard, for organizing this. And thanks, Rebecca, as well. And thanks, everybody, for coming. OK, be well, everybody. And uh, take good care. Bye-bye.